Good morning, everybody. This is the Personal Playlist Podcast, fondly referred to as the P3 on Voice Ed Radio. I'm Noah Daniel. I am so excited to have Jim Cash here on the Personal Playlist Podcast. Jim is currently a modern learning resource teacher in the Peel District School Board. He holds a master's degree in educational technology and an undergraduate degree in cognitive psychology and education. In his career, he's taught grades one to eight in both Canada and Australia and has held headship and administrative roles. He's a regular presenter at conferences such as Echo, Connect, and Bring It Together and has written articles published in ISTE, OLA, and TBO. In July of 2018, he presented at Scratch at MIT Conference in Boston. Welcome to the show, Jim. Thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it. I'm so happy you're here. I just saw your article that came out in Medium about Scratch. Do you want to talk about the third version versus the second version? You seem to be excited about it, but still working out some of the tweaks. Yeah, you know, I mean, I've always been a Scratch enthusiast. Uh, I've been using it for 10 years, and I think it's a fantastic tool for students to use to be creative and uh, explore coding in a really meaningful, exciting way rather than being kind of taught with lessons and, and Scratch is made that way. And that's one of the points I try to at least get across in my blog post that it's made from the get-go to help students support them in a wide variety of ideas and help students who are right at the beginning stages of coding and in more sophisticated programmers. So anyway, uh, Scratch 3 is an update. It just came out, gee, I guess just almost a month ago, just in the new year. And there's some really cool uh, improvements like the uh, if you're a scratcher, you'll probably know what I'm talking about. The sound editor and the uh, sprite editor, those have been improved. Uh, there's some new blocks there. There's some improvements to some of the blocks. Just the ability to more easily incorporate things like using the micro bit with Scratch. Um, plus, I think one of the biggest advantages of Scratch 3 is that now it can run on virtually any device. In the, in the, previ- in the past, it was Flash-based, so it never ran on Apple products. So now it runs on pretty much anything you want to run it on. And that's a great news for schools, especially iPad heavy schools. Yeah, I think that that is really important. And a lot of schools, even though they're getting Chromebooks, have iPads. So it gives accessibility and it really is a great entry point to coding. I've even experienced it myself and I'm still new at all of that. We met at, well, you were doing an Ignite talk before an event. Do you want to talk a little bit about that night? I really enjoyed your your talk. So which, remind me of that, was that at uh, at uh, Air Mills Town Center? Yeah, we were at Robert Marlachi's Mindshare Learning Space. Right, and that was just a, a quick little Ignite talk about uh, kind of using coding in kind of the way that I think is really powerful with students. It was a, a nine-month-long project-based learning activity and inquiry-based activity where students in a school in Brampton that I support. I support 26 schools in Peel as a modern learning resource teacher, as you said before. Um, so they were just uh, developing a basic competency in coding and scratch by creating their own projects that were exciting to them. And once they had that, we gave them a design challenge. And that was something that they all really enjoyed. It was create a game that helps, helps uh, younger people learn about fraction concepts. So right away, they had questions. Who are we doing this for? We partnered up with the grade two class in the school. And uh, they basically went through and, and created themselves through the activity and through the whole experience of it all, the design process, which we kind of put together at the very end of it in June when we reflected on it. The idea of the grade twos, we have to find out about the grade twos. What do they like about games? What do they know about fractions? Uh, and so on. And they would come down regularly and try out the games uh, in the middle of creating them and say what they liked and say what they didn't like and give suggestions. And then they would take those ideas and incorporate them. And that happened repeatedly month after month. So the iterative process of the design process was was lived and experienced. And uh, it was a fantastic experience, I think, for everyone involved and kind of demonstrates where like using Scratch and a coding tool is just that. It's just a tool. It's a small part of a much larger project. Yeah, and the ideation probably behind it came from an interdisciplinary approach. Like, I really liked listening to what you were saying and thinking about all the different syntheses. Because, yes, there was math, but yes, there was audience and purpose. And yes, there was coding, which has a lot of different applications. And then, of course, the idea of 
like just going through the design cycle is is good for any kind of learning. So it's nice to see things being cross curricular as often as possible. Yeah, and I totally agree with that. And um, one of the th- one of my mantras is uh, sort of a piece from a, a, a video that Mitch Resnick put together a year or two ago, and he said one of the most important things in a rapidly changing world is the ability to think and act creatively. And I really think that's important. And anything that we can do where that is one of the main things that we're focusing on with students, uh, that, that could be the focus. You can take whatever curriculum you want. But I think that's a really important thing for that students have that opportunity to think and act creatively every day. Yeah, with the with the new ideas in modern learning coming out to evaluative form and that the idea that we have to actually assess critical thinking and creativity among the others, the global competencies, hopefully people will immerse themselves in more and more of those opportunities. And in a lot of ways, this is such an opportunity because this is a creative process that you go through as an individual and it's a personalizing experience. So why don't you tell our audience a little bit about preparing your nostalgic identity and pick me up or inspirational songs for your appearance here on the personal playlist podcast. Okay. So um, we had to pick, you know, three songs, three pieces, nostalgic identity, inspiring. And uh, you kind of picked me at this point in my life. If you picked me, if you picked, not picked, if you came upon me at any other time in my life, it would probably be three radically different songs because you know, probably like many people, I went through a Beatles phase, for example, and uh, there's all these different times and, and different interests in music. So right now, I'm really interested, and you'll probably get a sense of what I'm interested in, in the uh, pieces that, that I've picked. So it, um, do you want me to start with a nostalgic piece, or do you want me to just talk about how I kind of went through the process? You can happily go into that, but I think it, I think I do want to know about the process, but I think that it's true that the P3 is a snapshot of an intersection of space, place, and time. Mm-hmm. And I think that whatever that is, it's, it's a capturing of where you are right now. And even if tomorrow your songs change, you get to celebrate that this is where you are today. So sure, let us know a little bit about the process. Yeah, so uh, probably like many of your guests, and this is like one of the things I'd love to chat about with you sometimes is what kind of patterns have you seen when you ask that question? Because I'd like to know the process that people go through. Uh, but probably like a lot, as I, I listened to a few of these podcasts uh, that you did uh, with different people, and they kind of picked a small set of them for each category and then finally picked one for your show. And that's kind of what I did as well. Um, and like I said, if you picked me maybe 10 years ago, I was really into trance, if you can believe it, and uh, all that kind of stuff. And you wouldn't think at all that I like almost any other kind of music if you look at my stuff today. But I really am a music lover and a wide variety of genres I love. And I, I, I'm i glad that you said that because I don't think that anybody reduces you to the genre choices, but this is really what you get to share. Right, so right. it's important to give people a sense that it's not the totality of your interest, but these are the songs you picked for now for this experience. So exactly. let's go back. Okay. Let's go back to your nostalgic song and the music and the melodies that drive this contagious, sprawling adventure that is this music. So my nostalgic piece is a piece called uh, Blue Train by John Coltrane. And that was released, I believe, in 1958. Might have been recorded a bit earlier than that. Um and one of the reasons why I chose that over some of the other ones, and like just off the top of my head, some of the other songs I had thought of was uh, And It Stoned Me by Van Morrison, Three is a Magic Number, Schoolhouse Rock. Do you remember Schoolhouse Rock? Um, yes, I remember. Uh, <laughs> there was a Partridge Family song in there, uh, sort of. So anyway, that I picked Blue Train because I uh, the, the very first time I heard it, was during the 80s, so I'm giving away my age here, the 80s when I was a teenager and I spent a lot of time in uh, record and CD shops uh, as a teenager. I grew up in, in Kitchen Waterloo, so I went to Encore Records and there was a sunrise there and I'd go to Toronto and go to Sam's and Vortex Records. But I think I was in Encore and I heard this being played and they always had something that was played and they'd stick the CD up on a paper or a, or a clip you know, it's now playing, so to speak. So I went up and found what it was and asked who it was and, and bought the, bought it that same day. 
And it, every time I hear it, not only do I love the music, but it reminds me of that time. Um, just spent exploring new music. Often I was there with friends uh, uh, and other times there by myself, uh, looking for things that I'd heard on the radio that people recommended, um, albums from long ago of artists that I liked currently, and I would, would go back in time and try and find some of their earlier albums. So that's that's nostalgic for that reason, because it really, it's sort of a theme of exploring new music. And I didn't know a lot about jazz at that time. And that kind of was an introduction to that, that genre. And I started to learn more about it and explore it further. Yeah, it's a, it's an interesting genre. And, you know, the whole concept of improvisation, if you're talking about creativity, yeah. it's an extremely powerful genre. This, uh, actually, your song is the title song of John Coltrane's 1958 album by the same name. That's right. And it's one of the most widely known instances of a 12 bar blues song, which I thought was really interesting because I, I didn't know that. And I think I've heard it. But when I listen to it, it's amazing to listen to things with new ears. So here is your nostalgic song, Blue Train. <laughs> with a song like that because the saxophone begins plays once through and then the rest of the band joins in right but you had to like i had to keep playing it until until we heard you know everybody getting together but then we didn't get to hear that the solos that come later right so definitely hear the rest of that what are you thinking when you hear it right now well uh, like i was saying before it really takes me back to those times uh, when I was exploring music, it really is the theme of exploring music. And what I've, one of the cool things about living in this time that we live in now is that you can go to YouTube and find some old recordings that are on film or very early television uh, of some of these performances. And they're live um, and it's on YouTube. And you couldn't do that in the past. It would be so difficult to find the actual performance of not only the music, but the artist, and it was uh, it's recorded for you to see. So that's, uh, it was kind of making me think of that because I, I recently I was on YouTube and I was looking uh, at a number of older recordings of performances and just thinking how amazing it is. And this is one that I definitely could not find as a live performance to see, see it, but you can definitely go on YouTube and, and just find the audio. Hmm. It actually, that got me thinking about your identity song because one of the things about this particular artist's version of this song is he talked about, he had, he's on a recent interview, and he talked about the piano becoming only interesting when you put colors on it and the neutrality of instruments in certain situations. And then kind of what you're saying, you know, when you have YouTube that can tease out the colors of, a, of, a, of an artist in a certain situation, 
you know, that's the beauty of music is the same song can be reinvented by the very same artist, even when they're playing it. So yeah, it, it's those kinds of things that make it so deep and powerful. Um, when you were choosing your identity song, why did you choose this piece of all the pieces? Well, uh, again, I could have easily chosen a whole bunch of other things. Like some other pieces on my list was like Come Sail Away by Styx, which certainly I'm not a huge Styx fan, but I love that song. Uh, I Am a Rock from Simon and Garfunkel. But for this particular song, um, I think it's because um, I I really identify, it comes from a time in my life when I was kind of identifying with classical music more and I was really starting to explore it in a serious way. Um, a friend of mine in high school, all my other friends listened to sort of popular music. And when I made a new friend in high school one day, I asked him, what What do you like listening to? And he listed off all the composers, not even a single modern popular artist. And it sort of intrigued me. There was no embarrassment about it. And he just really enjoyed it. And I thought, here's, here, here's somebody who just loves this kind of music. And that was sort of my introduction. And then I started to really explore it. And there was a, there was a, a, a CBC broadcast. I think it was... Uh, like summer of 82, something like that. And it was exploring uh, Mozart's piano concertos. And uh, I still remember the host's name, Jacob Siskind, and there was a Beaux-Arts trio, pianist Menachem Presser, who was playing the piano live. They went through, over many weeks, every single Mozart concerto, and and movement by movement, and talked about them and played different performances and interpretations. And it was, to me, it was like a revelation. It was just incredible that... I never saw or understood the depth before. Like when I was younger than 14, I hated classical music. I couldn't stand it. Um, it just sounded like elevator music and had no meaning to me. And then um, this particular piece, though, is one of my favorites. And that's why I chose it, um, especially the slow movement, which is the one the one movement that I chose. Um, and uh, I think hopefully when it's played, uh, hopefully the listeners might, might realize why, because I think it's uh, an amazing piece of music. Uh, and it's got um, a, a lot of connection to me as, as part of my identity as a musician. Okay, what do you play? I play the piano, strangely enough. <laughs> okay, well, that makes good sense. Here is Mozart's Piano Concerto Number no. 22, performed by Daniel Berenboim and the English Chamber Orchestra. So yeah, that that's the ending of that concerto and and uh, of that particular movement, the second, the Andante second movement of that concerto. And an interesting side note to that is the very first time Mozart performed that, which is I think 
December 1785, something like that. He um, was asked by the audience there to repeat the whole movement. They asked for it to be repeated, and because they, it was uh, almost it was almost like an immediate encore. They wanted to hear it again, which, um, from what I've read about it, was ex- was highly unusual. Um, and concerts back then were different than they are now. This would have been maybe a hundred people that he was performing for, so it was more of an intimate, smaller group, and it was not like the performer and the audience were very separate. It was sort of right in there with it. But I just thought that was really interesting. And and to me, this is, it's, it's a uh, sort of the heart of this concerto. Um, and the fascinating thing about uh, learning about it first from this broadcast on CBC when I was a teenager was the idea that different pianists and orchestras can come to it and interpret it in different ways. And it's something that maybe I didn't put a lot of thought into before I heard that concept and now what I what I often do is if I really like a, a song or, or a, a, a piece, a classical piece, I'll get it performed by many different artists. So mm. my my iTunes bill is quite high sometimes. <laughs> but, I'll you know, this this particular piece, I think I've got Baron Boehm. There's another pianist named Edwin Fisher, Robert Cassettesu, um, Edwin Schnabel. There's uh, not Edwin Schnabel, um, but Schnabel is one of the pianists, but there's different interpretations of this concerto. When you hear it played by different people, you definitely get a different sense and a different feeling. But Baron Boehm's is my favorite of this particular concerto. It's funny, actually, in that same interview, Baron Boehm said, I think Mozart was the only composer who had the perfect combination between seriousness, talent, genius, lightheartedness, and facility. It made me think about how, you know, an educator doing the kind of work that you do has to kind of balance between having, you know, real talent and pensions for the kind of work that you're doing and and seriousness and planning, but also that lightheartedness fun because the work is about kids and you want to be able to enjoy it. That's interesting. Yeah. I mean, be, teaching, as I'm sure you know, is a bag of tricks uh, in many ways. So many different uh abilities and competencies and thoughts and energies have to be have to come together to do I think a really good job so that's really interesting yeah but that's the symphony right Right. you bring it together and if you don't have it you bring it from other people together to create that something special yeah yeah that's a really good analogy um anyway your last song is your inspiring song so this is a very interesting person and I was doing some research on him. And uh, would you like to introduce the song? I have some questions about it. Great. And uh, this person is new to me, too. I only discovered this song um, probably around the time that you asked me to do this, which was in the fall, maybe, or whatever. But uh, I just, yeah. I think it, would, it appeared in one of my YouTube playlists uh, one time, and I and I listened to it, and I loved it. So Jan Tiersen is the is the composer and musician, and this piece is called Pours Gorit. And this, this the album that it comes from is called, uh, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing anything correctly here, but EUSA, E-U-S-A, and it was released in 2016. And each of the pieces on that album, there's about 10 of them, they all are inspired by a different location around where he lives. So he records ambient music uh, of the location, and then he composed a piece that matches that. So the reason why this is inspiring mm-hmm. to me is that when I first heard this, um, it it really felt familiar to me. And as I listened to more of the album, of his album, uh, which I bought right away on iTunes, uh, it felt really uh it felt really good and it felt really familiar, even though it was brand new music. And I've always enjoyed writing music for the piano. I, I've never written for anyone or any purpose other than for myself, just to amuse myself. It was like painting or gardening or whatever. Um, but I immediately identified with it because he tends to use similar progressions and themes that I use, although he's definitely far more developed than his technique and, and far more accomplished than I am. But it's inspiring to me because it, it, it's literally inspiring. It makes me think, wow, how can I push myself to uh, do different things with what I'm trying to write and what I'm trying to say uh, in my own music? And uh, and it just was really exciting that, you know, I, I'd never heard of this person before. And then suddenly this comes along and it's a whole, it just, it's like a doorway. It opens up and all this new music, uh, it, it just sort of pours out and it's uh, 
continues to inspire me to this day. So what have you learned about him from your research? Because I don't know a lot about He's a French composer and he's been around since the early 90s. Uh, He's nothing new, actually. But what have you learned about him? No, but he seems to be upset that he's so often as a French musician associated with Amelie, which was the score that he had composed and won awards for. And he's constantly trying to say, I do other things. Please don't reduce me. Not that I'm not proud of this work. I think about that sometimes, like with people and their known accomplishments, it's hard to move on from the things that people um, can touch. And yet, so that's why I think it's so interesting that, you know, he wrote about his home in the island of Ushant off the coast of Brittany, kind of like that touchstone to a place when maybe people weren't giving him the space to have that. So I just, I had some questions about that, but I really liked where you went with it. So I'm going to leave it kind of as, as your inspiration to pushing yourself further Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, finding your own GPS through your work. Exactly. So it's a, and it's a fantastic. And I remember as soon as I heard this piece, I went to the piano immediately and tried to pick it out and I picked out about half of it. Um, And uh, it it was, that's how exciting it was when I first heard it. So this piece that you're about to hear is uh, it's, it's, uh, it was the first one that I heard. And I think it's probably the best track off the album. I hope I pronounced it correctly. It's Paul's Goulet. your p3 now that you've shared your songs i'm feeling pretty good <laughs> no it's a, this is a really interesting um exercise because it, it forces you to kind of stop and reflect at least where you are at this particular point in time and uh you know think about things that are meaningful to you so yeah no it's it's exciting and i'm hoping that anybody who listens to any of this might hear something especially that last piece and say wow that sounds pretty cool i might check that out jim you are one of the authors of peel's empowering modern learners vision which has become a key component of the board's plan for student success you're an active blogger who posts on medium and makelearn.org you continue to learn about learning from children and share ideas about coding and mathematics on scratchmathland.com you can connect with jim on twitter at cash jim Do you have anything else you want to add about this experience before I play you out? No, uh, just uh, that I appreciate you thinking of me and uh, it was a great experience and I can't wait to hear more of this podcast because I've only heard a handful and I'm going to go back and uh, listen to some more. So thank you very much. Oh, it's my pleasure. I hope you have a wonderful day. You too. Thank you for joining us on the P3, the personal playlist podcast. I'm Noah Daniel. This is Voice Ed Radio, and I hope you have a fantastic day.